Okay guys, in this lesson we're going to learn how to play the Pyrrhus against the Fianchetto variation. We're going to be analyzing a very important game that I played a few years ago in a tournament. And finally, since this variation is not so complicated, I'm going to have time to give you a few tips on how to analyze your games after a tournament. And more importantly, there's a very special tip that you could use to determine what areas, what kind of position you're having difficulties with so that you can work on them and steer your training in the right direction. So with that said, guys, let's get to it. The first thing that I need from you is to take a look at these two positions. Both positions are from my game and in the first one I just need you to think of what you do next as the black pieces. There's no doubt that the black pieces have a superior position but still it's not so easy to make decisions here. One mistake and we lose all the initiative that we have. Now in the second position it should be way simpler for you guys but for this one I really need you to like always type in the comments what you think about this position, what your plan is, your next move because I need to know if we need to keep working on positions like this or if we're ready to move on and not talk about this anymore. So for this position just let me know who do you think is better and what your plan would be. And that's your way to communicate to me where we need to be steering our training. So assuming that you did this, let's talk more about this variation in the Pierce defense. So let me put everything back. And let me tell you first that the game that I played, guys, my opponent did not do D4, which is the main line. Instead, he did D3. But that's fine because that way we're going to be talking about the theory with D4 but you're also going to see how you could play it if someone plays d3 instead. So anyways, d4, knight f6, knight c3, g6, and then we get the Fianchetto variation. Guys, this is not exactly like the, the Fianchetto variation against the King's Indian defense that we talked about in lesson, I want to say 86, 87, but still it's good to know more or less where your pieces go. Again, it's not that complicated, but we need to know the main ideas like we've been doing with the other variations of the pits. So after g3, we have bishop g7, bishop g2, castle, and then here, the main line for the white pieces is knight g2 e2. Guys, if they did knight f3, just know it is okay. It's just that the white pieces typically don't do it because they don't like this bishop g4 move. So we're pinning the knight, and we could use some of the same ideas that we learned in the classical variation. So from here, we could do knight c6, e5, and take advantage of the fact that the knight is going to be pinned. And another reason is that typically when they play this variation, they want to do f4, just like we learned in lesson number 34, where we learned how to play the Vienna with this Fianchetto variation. So it's very similar, and that's why you're going to see a lot of players with the white pieces just doing knight g2, e2. But again, knight f3, we meet that with bishop g4, knight c6, and pawn e5. Now, knight g2, e2, Notice that they're not putting pressure on e5, just the pawn, the knight is not on f3, so we're going to strike the center right away. Guys, if we don't do this, the game could get a little bit complicated, so why not? You could delay it, and you're going to see in my game that I delayed e5, but only because the pawn was not on d4. So I knew I was going to have time to strike the center, but all of you should know by now, this is lesson number 97 in the pits, we want to break on e5. So anyways, at this point in the game, the white pieces again have two choices. The typical one or the main line is pawn to h3 and the idea is the following. They know that we're putting pressure on d4, most likely we're going to be putting pressure on it, we're going to exchange on d4 and they want the bishop to be there. But if they just do, let's say castle, then we continue with knight c6. And by the way, there are a few lines that you could choose here as a black pieces. You could play it with c6. This is not a plan that we learned in the, in the classical variation. But to me, knight c6 comes very naturally. And as a matter of fact, when I first faced the Fianchetto variation, I did not know anything about it. I had not prepared anything against it. I just played what made sense to me. And knight c6 is a move that came to me naturally. And it's very important that you learn to listen to yourself. By this point in the course, you should have a very good understanding of the pits, so you should be able to make decisions in your opening and middle game based on everything that we have learned so far. So anyways, if knight c6 here, let's say they go bishop e3 now, we could do knight g4, hitting that bishop, that's not what they want. And if they did something like h3 now, well, we could take, take again, and since the queen is on the same diagonal as the bishop, after rook e8, I'm getting ready to do knight takes e4. And the bishop is attacking the queen, the rook is defending the knight. So this is something that it's going to make the white pieces move the queen again. So this is exactly what they try to avoid when they do pawn to h3 early in the game. So again, here, instead of castling, the main line is going to be h3, and that's fine. We're going to do the same thing, knight c6, 
bishop e3 it's just that even though we're doing the same thing we have to remember at this point the only thing to keep in mind is that we're going to take on d4 once but we do not want this bishop to be on the same diagonal as our bishop at least not forever so that's why we're not going to take on d4 instead we keep this tension in the center and we continue developing our pieces so we're going to do bishop d7 rook e8 and then i'm going to show you what you could do in the middle game after you do these final developing moves anyways bishop d7 Again, if we did this move, then it's going to be a little bit uncomfortable to have this bishop here. You could do it, but like I said, you have to make sure that it's not permanent that this bishop stays here. So sometimes you see this exchange followed by c5 and the bishop moves up. And as a matter of fact, you're going to see it in a moment. So let me just go back. And again, after e takes e4, knight takes e4, bishop d7, castle, and we're going to go rook e8. That said, your development is complete and now it's time to play chess. This is already move number 11, we're in the middle game. You just need to understand a few more things if you want to feel comfortable. But at this point in the game, even if you don't know anything else about the middle game, you just play chess. Apply the principles that we have learned so far and you're going to be fine. Now, before we go over those middle game plans, which come after moves like rook e1, very natural move, trying to protect that pawn when the time comes, developing the rook. Let me just mention something here that you should know. Sometimes the white pieces, they play mechanically and they go with f4, which is a move that a lot of people like to do here as the white pieces. Now, if they did f4, there is a move that I've done a few times in this position, positions that look like this one, where since the bishop is hanging, they did f4, the pawn is not protecting the bishop anymore, you could do knight takes e4. And the idea is that after they take, well, you have d5, they have to give you the knight back, or you get that important bishop that is hanging on e3. So just something to keep in mind, whenever you see that f4 push, take a look and see if you could take advantage of it. Many times you just can't, but it doesn't hurt to take a look. And this is something that, as you get more experience, is going to happen automatically. F4, oh, I remember there was a bishop hanging on E3, or maybe I could do something else. Just pay attention to those pawn pushes, because we know by now that whenever pawns are pushed, weaknesses are created. So just something to keep in mind. Now, if instead they go rookie one, this is when you have to decide what kind of middle game you want. I personally like to continue with one of these two. Either I take, like I said before, followed by c5, bishop e3, bishop c6. And at this point, I feel really comfortable. I have a left behind pawn. We know about this pawn. We learned about it in lesson 44, 45. But I'm putting a lot of pressure on e4. And I could even expand on the queen side, guys. So this is a very comfortable game. It's hard for the black pieces to create anything because I have very active pieces. Easy for me to create counterplay. Now, the other plan that you could do if you don't like this kind of pawn structure, you could do queen c8. This is another plan for you to keep in mind. And this is something that we typically get done to us when we have the fianchetto, but now we could do it. Now, don't think that we're just putting pressure on that pawn. Of course, they're not going to fall for it. Most likely they do something like king h2, but the point is we have our pieces now in a very good position. That battery is going to be uncomfortable. Our queen is away from this file. And now the way they're going to continue here typically is by doing one of two things, either you bring the bishop to c6 eventually, or you could do something like a6, rook b8, and pawn b5. And the cool thing about this plan is that you could use it in other variations. I know this was one of the variations that I showed you on the King's Indian defense against the Fenkero variation, and we talked about it briefly, but you see how now it could be useful to you. So I hope that you paid attention back then. Now, before we go and analyze my game, let me just recap everything. This is extremely fast. But honestly, guys, there's not much more to it. Of course, I can show you lots of games. We can talk about the little details, but this is something that you could get by reviewing games on your own. Now, with that said, let me redo the moves. Let me show you again how the game could continue. And then I'm going to show you my own game and we can talk about other things. So again, e4, d6, we get to our typical setup. And then we have the fianchetto variation. We continue normally. We castle, we know that if not f3, it's not a mistake, There's not. it's not like we're going to punish or anything like that, but they could do it, well, bishop g4 could be annoying to them, followed by knight c6, e5, but again, the main line is knight g2, e2, we strike the center, no one is preventing us from doing so, then h3, if they just go bishop e3 right away, knight g4 could be annoying, because we're going to be not only hitting the bishop, we're also putting pressure on d4. If instead of doing h3, if they castle, well, knight c6, and then bishop e3 is going to be met by knight g4. 
if they do h3 now like they just wanted to delay by one move they're going to be wasting a few moves after we do rook e8 improving our rook and setting up a discovered attack on that queen so they have to move it again and if i activate the engine notice how it says negative 0.1 negative 0.2 which is nothing this is absolutely equal but it should say positive 0 0.2 0 0.3 0 0.4 so going back um, instead of castling instead of doing bishop e3 directly after we have e5 they should do pawn to h3 in this case we as the black pieces continue the same way so this is more about the white pieces being careful how they continue now what do we do well knight c6 very natural move again if you feel more inclined to play c6 you could play it, it's perfectly fine, you just need to be familiar with the kind of plans that you get in the middle game. Now, we are going to do knight c6, let's say they go bishop e3. Now, we take, and after they take on d4, remember, we don't like this bishop over here at least not permanently, so we just continue developing our pieces. Bishop goes to d7, rook goes to e8. So, bishop d7, castle, rook e8, and now this move, remember, we're putting pressure on e4, but also on that bishop so if they did something like f4 we have this idea of taking on e4 followed by d5 and we get the knight back or we get that hanging bishop on e3 if they continued with the right move which is rook e1 well now you could do remember queen c8 and you place a queen on a good position and along the way you're hitting that bishop on h3 now if you don't feel like doing queen c8 well you could go straight ahead and do pawn to a6 remember guys we know they're going to expand on the king side. Well, we're going to be expanding on the queen side. This is not the first variation where we have to adapt and we should know how to do this by now. So after a6, let's say they go pawn to f4. Well, we just do rook b8. First of all, we're getting away from this diagonal. So it's a very good prophylactic move. But more than that, we're getting ready to do b5 and b4. Again, this is a plan that we learned in the King's Indian defense lesson against the Fianchetto, so you could go back and revisit that as well. So there's a game where the white pieces just continued with queen d2, then we have knight a5, trying to get the knight to c4, we're gonna get rid of that bishop. And again, even though this is a little bit different to what we typically get in the pierce, it is a very nice way for you guys to improve your chess in general. You're just learning chess with this variation. So anyways, at this point, the white pieces could do b3 to prevent us from getting to c4, but that's going to make our bishop even stronger on that diagonal. And the other thing that they could do is queen to d3. So getting away from that, protecting c4, but then we have pawn to b5. And guys, we're ready now to do pawn to b4. And this is going to be extremely annoying for the white pieces. So in most of the games that you're going to find in this variation, the white pieces do b4, preventing you from doing that, but now there is a hole on c4. So after knight to c4, this has to be a very comfortable position for the black pieces. We have a very powerful knight, very powerful bishop on this diagonal. From here, we just play chess. This is already move number 15. And if I activate the engine, look, it says negative 0.4, 0 0.3. Again, it's not a huge advantage. This is equal actually. But at least I like this position as the black pieces. And even if you don't remember this in a month to month, these ideas are going to be at the back of your head. So whenever you need them, either in this variation, in the King's Indian Defense or any other variation that looks similar, you're going to recognize the patterns and you're going to be able to come up with a plan. So feel free to go over it. Now I'm going to put everything back and we're going to go over the game that I played. Now guys, in this game, my opponent played e4, and before I go deeper into the game, let me give you some information on why this game is so important. Well, this is a game that I played back in 2014 against a very strong master from Florida. Well, at least he plays a lot here in Florida. His name, I think, is uh, Corey Aker. And this game was the last round of the tournament. I had only drawn my first game, and I had lost to a very strong grandmaster, uh, Dr. Lars Bo Hansen. And by the way, this game that I lost was in the King's Indian defense against the Fianchetto. Then I go to the last round, I needed to win, and like I said in lesson number 69, whenever I have to go for a decisive game, I use the piece defense. Now, my opponent decided to do the Fianchetto variation here, but you're going to see how he was trying really hard to be aggressive. And since I had some experience with these positions, it was easy for me to 
identify some patterns and get a very comfortable position. Now I'm going to show you the first part of the game and then we're going to talk more about it. We're going to see how I had a good position, I let it go, but then thanks to a few things that we have discussed in this course, I was able to still win the game. So anyways, the game went pawn to e4, I went pawn to g6 and notice that I'm not doing d6 first. Um, I do this sometimes just to let the door open for my opponent to choose if he wants to continue with the pits or if he wants to do d4 and c4 and transpose into a king's Indian defense. So after my opponent did knight to c3, I went bishop g7, then pawn to g3 and pawn to d6. Guys, whenever you start with this move order, this is called actually the modern defense. To me, I just start like that and then I just do knight f6 and it transposes into the pit's defense. But it is important for you to know the difference between the modern and the pit's defense. Anyways, at some point in the future, I know that we're going to be talking more about the modern defense. It's slightly different. It could be really fun. So we're going to definitely talk about it. Now, after bishop g2, again, I just did knight f6. Now I have the exact same position that we have been studying lately. So it looks like we started with d6 and so on. So after knight to f6 we have d3 and this is the first deviation from the main line. So my opponent instead of doing d4 they just went d3. Now this is uh, slightly easier for me to play as the black pieces and not claiming the center so e5 is easier to insert. You could even play c5 if you're a Sicilian player and you could transpose. So instead, I just castled. Then he played h3 and notice how he's inserting this move. He understands it's really important. And again, guys, if you went over lesson number 34, this is exactly what we learned in that lesson. I like to do it myself as the white pieces. Why not? But we know that h3 is important, especially if you're planning to do f4. So after pawn to h3, I just went knight c6. I'm not in a hurry to do e5. This is a move that I could do at any time. So after knight c6 we have f4 and this is the first red flag. We know that this early f4 could just create weaknesses. It, it's typically not a good idea to push so early. Now I understand that maybe he wanted to do knight f3. He wanted the pawn out before he did that. But typically it is a better idea to do knight g2 e2, castle and then you want to do f4. Now, when he did f4, I knew that I had to create something. First, I'm almost developed already, e5 is due, but on top of that, the king is in the center, he hasn't castled, what if I could open the position to get to that king? So I went e5, it's a natural move, it goes with this opening anyways, but I'm trying to look for ways to get to that king. Maybe I can never take advantage of it, but if I could look for it, I'm going to. So after e5, knight f3, exactly what we suspected, they just wanted to push the pawn before getting the knight out. And then here, I want to see if you guys can pause the video and think of what you do next. Again, welcome to type in the comments what would you have done in this position. The more you interact with me, the easier it is for me to understand where you guys are at. So pause the video and feel free to spend a few minutes on this position. Now, a few things that I like to point out at this point in the lesson. Number one, the best move in this position is a move that we have talked about a lot at this point in the course. You saw it on our lessons on the pits. You saw it on that, even on that lesson where we used the Carlson's game where he used the pits and we did that exercise to determine your strength. You've seen it in the King's Indian Defense lessons and it makes perfect sense at this point in the game. Now, another thing that I wanted to do at this point in the lesson is start talking about how you should analyze your games after the tournament. What I do myself is when I finish the tournament, I like to analyze my games myself. No computer, no friends, no coach. I just set up the board and reproduce the game and I make notes. Okay, I think this was a critical position. I think this were my candidate moves because trust me, you might even see things that you did not consider during the game. During the game, you have a lot of pressure, you're just calculating so much, and you might be missing simple things. So maybe when you do this at home quietly, maybe you see things you didn't see before, or even if that's not the case, the fact that you're going over the game, you're making notes, you're determining the critical positions, you're calculating again. When you analyze the game afterwards with your coach, with the computer, you're going to be able to compare your thinking process, your knowledge, to what the computer is saying, to what your coach is saying. So that's the first thing that I wanted to say about that. Now the tip that I wanted to tell you for you to use in your games which could help you a lot after is the following. When I'm playing my games guys, whenever I get to a position that I know is critical, that I know that I need to spend time, that I feel like I don't know what to do, 
I write down next to the move. So let's say I get to, this is already move number eight. I'm about to make a move. So I'm going to write down how much time I have left on the timer. And by the time I make my decision, I do my move, I'm going to do the same thing next to that move because that's going to tell me how much time I spent on that critical position. Now here, this move that we're looking for, it shouldn't take you long to find. But if I did that, and after the game, I look at my notes and I realize that I spent 25 minutes on this position. I know that I'm not, I'm not comfortable with this kind of position. I need to work on it more. Of course, this is not the best uh, example maybe for this position, but just do that. If you are in a critical position, you could next to your notation, you could put how much time you had left and then you do the math and you're going to know exactly how long it took you on a specific position. Now, if you play online, Notice that I have a game here that I played on chess.com. Again, not the best example because this is a blitz game, but on chess.com, I don't know if you could do it on Lee Chess or other websites, but on chess.com, you could activate the timestamps and basically it tells you how long it took you per move. So if I'm going over this game and I looked at there's one move or one position where it took a lot of time, well, I want to look into it and I want to analyze why is it so hard for me to make a decision on this position? Maybe I couldn't calculate clearly. Maybe I was not familiar with this kind of position. So that's something for you to work on during your training. So anyways, timestamps, you could activate it. If you're playing training games on chess.com, it's a good feature to have. Or you could do it manually in tournaments. Of course, you don't have this. So you have to do it yourself. So with that said, let me activate the engine actually and you're going to see how, look, the black pieces are already ahead negative 1.2. So this is a significant advantage and notice how the top move is definitely knight h5. Guys, g3 is weak, f4 came in too weak. So f4 not only leaves this guy hanging when it's on e3, it also leaves g3. So they're just weaknesses on the king side. And now knight h5 is allowing us to take the initiative and this is really important for me playing this last game where i needed to win it was really nice to see an edge like this because i could give my opponent a hard time now with that said you're going to see how my opponent he's a very strong player and you're going to see how even though i got him in trouble he was able to get away from it of course i didn't play well and that's another point that i wanted to make but we're going to talk about it later in the game so anyways after not h5 they have to be careful how they defend g3 because if they push, well, we're taking on f4. If they do king f2, well, that king is not going to castle. I might even try to open up the f file. So what they did was knight e2. So they're just rerouting the knight, very simple, protecting g3, bringing more support to f4. But that's fine. Now I just took anyways. He took back with the pawn, of course. We talked about this in lesson number 91. In this middle game positions, it just makes sense. Now he's controlling all of these squares. He doesn't want to give me any nice squares for my knights. So he took, but now guys, the follow-up to all of this, knight h5, pawn takes pawn, the follow-up is pawn to f5. Again, it's another move that is thematic in the king's in defense, in the pits. So for all of you who have been following this course, this is a move that you have come to mind immediately, f5. Now, you also saw this done to me when I played on lesson number 95, when I played this 2100 bot, they did a similar move to me, and they left me with a questionable pawn structure. But anyways, I'm just saying all of this talk for you guys to understand that all of this you should be familiar with. So anyways, after pawn to f5, they castled. Now I want to keep putting pressure on e4. So my queen is going to be developed to e7. Notice that I want to go to h4, but it's not safe, at least not yet. So queen e7 happened. Then knight e1 to defend e4, you see, I'm just putting pressure every move that I do is an attacking move so they have to react by defending so it's pretty clear that the black pieces have the initiative and we have to continue to play energetically by improving our pieces so 91 look my pieces are coming out his pieces are going back necessary it's not a big deal but I know that I'm the one in control now now after the knight goes back I, I really want to bring my queen to h4 I want to do knight g3 so this knight is bothering me. You should know the move by now. If I want to remove the knight, well, knight d4, I'm bringing my pieces forward, I'm being aggressive. And after he took, bishop takes with a check. And then after king h2, of course, our queen is going to come to h4. Now guys, this is a good moment to take a break because I'm definitely better here 
I have told you so many times, at this point, we have to continue to be energetic. We cannot let our opponent get any counterplay. We have to stay on top of the game. But you're going to see how I was not able to get the most out of this game. Plus, um, I have to say, my opponent did a very good job at defending. So no excuse. I played this bad. I'm, I'm sure I made mistakes. But on top of that, my opponent knows what he's doing. He played very well defensively. So going back to how we analyze games after the tournament, this is a position where when I was analyzing this on my own with no computers, I made a note. Okay, I think that after move number 15, this is a critical position. I had to evaluate the position. I came up with candidate move again, and I made my notes, just like I did in the real game, but I did it again. And then when I compared to what the engine said, I realized that I misjudged this position. And I think this is the position that I showed you actually was after E5. I showed you this position before, and this is a good opportunity for you as well to compare what you thought of to what the computer is recommending. Now guys, this move in itself shows you how my opponent knows what he's doing, how he's also looking for active ways to defend. If I activate the engine now, notice that, look, I'm winning by 2.3. This is a huge advantage. And the best move here, look, is E5. So my opponent knew what he was doing. That's the top move here. Now, after he did E5, I took, and then my opponent continued with c3. Now, my bishop can now go back to this diagonal. Not that I wanted to. I think this is a better diagonal, but I definitely had to make a decision. And now that I think about it, I think this is the position that I showed you after I took on e5. So c3, and again, the question is, what do I do with my bishop? To me, it made a lot of sense to just go to f2 because I'm bringing more pieces closer to that king. But if I activate the engine, guys, Notice how the best move is bishop b6. We know that bishops work better from far away. They don't have to be like the knight. They don't have to be in the action to be able to, to help. So the better move was to bring the bishop back. Now my bishop is not going to be in the way being attacked because notice that after I did bishop f2, they did queen e2, activating the queen by hitting my bishop. It was just not accurate on my end to do bishop f2 but i learned guys after this game i learned next time that i have a similar situation i'm going to consider simply keeping it back putting the bishop away working from far away and keeping the pressure on my opponent that's how we learn i'm not going to get the exact same position but any attacking position like this where i have to move a piece i'm going to think harder especially if it is a bishop and this is how you improve your intuition this move these moves are going to just kick automatically many times because of mistakes like this but if you never analyze your games you're never going to learn from it and that's why it's so important that we actually put in the work so anyways i did bishop f2 queen e2 now bishop g3 check i'm still better here if i activate the engine look 3.8 so it's not like bishop f2 was horrible but you're going to see how my game started to just change. And for a moment, he was the one taking the initiative later. Now, one last thing before we just continue with the game. Sometimes when you're attacking, maybe you don't get checkmate, you don't get to destroy your opponent, but they have to make concessions and that's going to lead to a better end game for you. So that's why it's so important that even if you are an attacking player, that you really study end games. And that's exactly what happened in this game, guys. The only reason why I was able to win this game is because I understood endgames and very simple. You're going to see that it was a very simple endgame. Actually, I showed you that position already. And even though I'm thinking here, okay, I want to attack. I want to get to the king. I'm also looking for things that could help me in the endgame. So if I could go from here to a favorable endgame, well, I'm going to take it. If this gets too complicated, too, too weird for me, and I see an easy way to walk into a superior endgame, I'm going to take it. But for that you need to be familiar with such patterns. So anyways, after I did bishop g3, we have king g1, and then I just took on f4. Now, a few things about this move. Number one, um, I'm bringing my knight closer, and we know the knight needs to be in the area if he wants to help. I'm also taking that pawn, so assuming that all of my attack evaporates, I'm going to be left with a pass pawn, a protected pass pawn, definitely this is just a winning endgame. If I remove all of the pieces, there's no more attack, but it's going to be a very easy endgame to win. Another thing about this move, notice how I could have taken with so many different pieces. So this is a good point for you to say, you know what, this is what I think is best, these are my reasons behind it, 
And then you could compare it to what the engine says, what your coach says, and it's another opportunity for you to see if you're correct or if you aren't, it's a good opportunity for you to learn something new. In this game, I just took with the knight, it made sense to me for all of the reasons that I said before. Then my opponent simply took, of course, he's eliminated my knight, less pieces to, for me to attack him with, and he's trading my knight for a bishop that had not even developed. So after he took, I took back with my bishop, and at this point of the game, all of the pressure that I had starts to disappear. Notice how I only have now queen and bishops around in the king, which is defended by so many pieces. If you go back to the basics, we have less attackers than they have defenders, so it's very unlikely that we have anything here. Now with that said, I also have two extra pawns, so even if my attack is gone, I'm going to have a better end game. I just have to keep it cool, I cannot make any silly mistakes. My opponent, very nicely, he went bishop d5. I had to move my king and now knight g2 getting rid of that bishop and forget about my attack. Now after knight g2 I went queen g5, pinning the knight, keeping my queen in the area, but then pawn to d4. And again guys, I know that I make mistakes, but my opponent is finding the best moves. So these are active moves that are allowing him to get back in the game. So after d4, Queen f6, most likely a mistake here. So they just took my bishop, I had to take, and another great move from my opponent. And this is, I think, the most uncomfortable I felt in the entire game. Instead of taking the pawn like anyone who have done, including myself, my opponent did rook a to e1. Instead of getting a pawn, a doubled pawn, he's looking for activity. If he gets to my seventh rank, forget about it. Now, this made me feel like when I was a beginner that I lost so many games because of my lack of development. And at that point, I remember myself thinking, why? Why didn't I develop this bishop earlier? In many cases, it's not a big deal if you're aware of it, if you know that you have to get your piece developed, you have to prevent them from getting to the seventh rank. So if you're aware of your problems, you're going to be able to fix them. But if you don't, if you let them get to the seventh rank, well, you're going to go through a very uncomfortable experience. Now, in this game, I did Pawn to c6, I need the bishop gone, bishop b3. Now this bishop, of course, is going to stay on this diagonal, and then I just went pawn to f3. Now this is a move that I thought was really cool because this is what I'm thinking. I don't want the queen to get to the seventh rank, so if they take with the queen, well, forget about it, I go bishop d7, the rook cannot enter the seventh rank. If instead they just take with the rook, well, I'm gonna go bishop d7, and if queen is seven, then rook e8, and at this point we just trade pieces, they cannot get to the 7th rank, and again, I have a superior end game, I have a protected pass pawn. So that's the reason behind f3, but after I checked it with the engine, the engine is saying that it was just not a good move. Guys, notice how I'm still ahead, but not like before, so I need to be very careful. Best move was bishop d7, a5, even queen g5 I see now, but anyways, um, I did f3, then my opponent took with a rook, then bishop d7, rook e3, and now his three major pieces are on the only open file in the game. Now, not a big deal. At this point, I, I had proven that I was a really bad attacking player, but I had an opportunity to go for an endgame and show him that I knew how to play endgame. So what I did was rook a to e8, trying to simplify the game. I simplify the game, I walk into a winning end game. So my opponent, of course, wants to avoid trading pieces, so queen f2, I went queen g5 check, rook g3, queen h4. Now, I know that I could have taken only one, but there's no rush. That rook is going to be traded. If they move it away, well, they're going to give me the open file for me to put pressure on. So after queen h4, they traded themselves. I take with a rook, of course. Now, I'm the one controlling the open file. Then king h2, pawn to f4, and it looks like I'm doing f4 just to simplify the queens, but instead I'm using the fact that I'm walking into a better endgame for them to get uncomfortable and make concessions. So since they don't want to get into that endgame, they're going to play defensively, and maybe I get another chat at attacking their king and getting them in trouble. So rook f3, again, I know about the endgame plan that I just mentioned, but I said, you know what, this position now is calling for a little bit more of pressure, I want to keep the queen on the board. So queen h5 and I have my rook on the open file, my queen is putting pressure on h3 along with the bishop, and my king is pretty safe on h8. So I was ready to attack again, but my opponent found a way out 
once more. So my opponent did pawn to d5. Now I have to say I did not see that move coming. So I just took queen d4. Notice how they pushed the pawn so that the queen could come in with that very nice check and attack my king from the diagonals. Now I took queen d4, then queen e5, they took on f4, and now again it got a little bit tricky for me. Notice how he distracted my attack. But again, we walk into an endgame where now I don't have the pass pawn, but I have two versus one. And again, this should be pretty easy for me to play. I don't know if I'm going to win it 100%, but my plan is going to be very simple. For my opponent, he must be relieved. He has been under a lot of pressure and he got away from it. So it's really nice. But at the end of the day, he's still in an inferior position. So I just went g5, they took, rook takes back. And then the rook gets to the seventh rank. This is what I was concerned with, but it was very easy for me to solve. So bishop c6, I'm activating the bishop, I'm protecting b7, protecting d5, and now I'm ready to be the one getting to the seventh rank. So finally, my opponent decides to go back and defend. The bishop is not so active. So this gives me a break and I start to go after and make progress. Guys, end game automatically one thing should come to mind. I need to activate the king. So king g7, king g3. And now I did a move that I think got me the game, which is rook e3. Now I did this move because number one, if we just move back, well, his king is cut off. I'm going to activate my king. This is going to be a very easy end game. If he goes up like he did, well, after h6, now I'm threatening to do check followed by checkmate. So he sort of got himself into this mating net. So after h6, bishop c2, anticipating my bishop d7 move, then he blocked, and after i took, look at this, if he takes with the king, well, this is falling, he's definitely in trouble, but after he takes with the rook like he did, then I have king g6, and I'm threatening checkmate. So he was forced to do rook f3, then check, king g3, I trade rooks, and I walked into this one end game guys this is an end game that you should be able to know with your eyes closed very simple pawn majority on the key on this side of the board g4 is coming i trade then my opponent has to be tied up to the defense of that pawn i could either do the stalemate position that we learned many lessons ago or i could simply use that pawn that pass pawn that i'm going to have as a bait and use my king to go after these pawns now not to leave you hanging if you're not that comfortable with this. Let me just see if I could finish this against the engine. I know there's an, uh, yeah, continue from here. Uh, play with the computer. And I want to play the most difficult one. I want to be the black pieces. And this should be fast. I'm not going to explain it, but just for you to see it in action. So a3, g4. I'm going to take back. There you go. I have my pass pawn. Now, if I do g3, I mean, it might be, it might be a little bit too soon but why not let me see if i do a5 b4 i could do a4 yeah let me do a5 first this king is not gonna go anywhere because my pawn is really close to promotion so let me do b5 king d4 well i'm gone well this is just too easy now i'm going to take then i get my queen then we take and guys we learned how to win queen and king versus king and pawn when the pawn is on the seventh rank so this one should be extremely easy now probably he goes here no he's not going there well let me bring my king and well let me bring my king even more check and then checkmate on the next move all right, guys, so look, even if we had gone all the way back here, let me see if here, if when I did this move, if the king goes back, well, I keep pushing and then my king comes in and collects this pawn. So I know this was not necessary for a lot of you, but I still wanted to make sure that we got that covered. So to recap, we get to the pits. If our opponent chooses to play the fianchetto, bishop g7, bishop g2, we castle, knight f3, we continue with bishop g4, knight g2 e2, well, we claim the center, the knight is not putting pressure on it. If they don't do h3, then we're going to continue with knight c6, 
probably taking on d4, bishop d7, rook e8. Remember, if they don't do h3, we always have this idea of knight g4. If they do it, it doesn't matter to us. Um, if they castle, remember, we take oh, knight d4. Since the queen is the one who has to recapture, now we're going to capture on d4, followed by rook e8, and we're threatening to do knight e4. If they do the more accurate move, which is bishop e3, we still take, and now we do not want to take because the bishop is going to be the one on that diagonal. So bishop d7, they castle, rook e8, rook e1. From here, you could do queen c8, interesting plan, or you could simply go straight to a6, rook b8, b5, and if they let you, your knight could get to c4. Besides that, remember guys, I know that a lot of you are planning to go back to playing tournaments over the board. So remember to take good notation and analyze your games on your own afterwards. Only when you do that, use the computer, talk to your coach, you can ask me questions, but do it on your own first. And during the game, remember to keep track of how long it takes you to come up with a plan, to come up with a move in certain positions. So like always, we're going to talk in the comments. Let me know what you guys thought of this game, of this variation, and I'll talk to you soon.